Hello everyone, welcome again. So today's lesson will be on the chemical earth. And in particular, our study for today will be on a first-hand investigation, and it will be the decomposition of a carbonate. Okay? And in this picture here, you've got cal uh, not calcium carbonate, this is copper carbonate, and you're heating it, and the copper, I know it's copper because of that very greenish blue color that we see there. Okay? So we're going to look at you know, decomposition of carbonate through heat. So our aim is to determine the products of thermal decomposition reactions, um, and in particular for carbonate decomposition reactions. Okay, so what do we need? Well, we need 5 grams of calcium carbonate. So we're not going to use uh, copper carbonate like in that picture. We're going to use this whitish um, calcium carbonate in the picture. Bunsen banner, obviously, for the heat part of it. Um, test tube, rubber stopper, and optionally, we could use lime water. Okay? Uh, we don't need this, but it's nice to have um, for the results part. We also need a match. Uh, you can interchange these two. Whichever one, if you have a matches on hand, that's good. If you have lime water on hand, that's good also. So either one will be fine. Okay? So we need a methodology. So we place 5 grams of calcium carbonate in the test tube, like this picture. I'm not sure if that's actually 5 grams, but you know, that's what we're essentially doing. Then we seal the test tube with rubber stoppers, okay? so like that. And then like in the first picture, we heat the contents of the test tube over the Bunsen burner for about five minutes. Okay? So we're heat heating the test tube. Okay? And then what we do is we allow it to cool. And this is important um, because if there's a gas produced, we want it to cool down so that it doesn't just you know, fly away straight away before we can analyze what it is okay? when we open the the test tube that is. So we want to try and keep the test tube cool or at least cool it down so that the gases don't escape too quickly before we can get a sample and analyze. Remove the stopper and place the lit match inside. Okay, so that's our next step. And if the flame goes out, as in this picture, then CO2 is present. Okay, so that's like that burning splint test for oxygen. It's just the opposite of that. A lit match will get put out by the, by the carbon dioxide. Okay? And that makes sense, right? Because you see carbon dioxide fire extinguishers. So if there's carbon dioxide present, it will hopefully put out this flame. Okay? Alternatively, if um, the gas can be siphoned off somehow, so if we can maybe grab a sample through a syringe or use a sidearm test tube, we can pump that gas through lime water and that will actually tell us straight away if the CO2 is present. So as you see here from left to right, you've got clear lime water, which is very nice. It's, very, it's almost like liquid, like clear water, sorry. It is a liquid, obviously. Now, as you continue to pump CO2 in, it gets cloudier from in the middle. And that's, there's a little bit of carbon dioxide in there. And then as you continue to pump carbon dioxide, it gets whiter and whiter. So if the if the lime water goes from clear to milky white, then you know you've got carbon dioxide available or carbon dioxide in that gas. Okay? So the results. What you should see. So CO2 should be detected by either the lit match or the lime water. So in this case, the lit match will go out. And in the lime water case, the lime water will turn from clear to cloudy. Okay? And we'll talk about, in the question segment, we'll be talking about what the reactions are actually happening in this, um, in this process. But for now, we just need to know that if it goes from clear to cloudy, we've got carbon dioxide available. Okay? So that concludes today's lesson on um, first-hand investigation. This is very simple, practical. All you're doing is heating a sample and then extracting another sample from that. And so we're trying to just to see what the products of the reaction will be. Okay? So we'll move on to the question segment now, and hopefully you'll be able to answer these questions and expand your knowledge on this very simple first-hand investigation. Okay? So knowing that carbon dioxide is the product of this reaction, calcium carbonate, write a balanced chemical equation for this process. Okay? 
So the question then becomes, well, do we get anything else out? Um, are we accounting for another chemical? So there's all these other questions and you don't, may not know where to start. So like I always say, just write down the things that you do actually know. We know that there's calcium carbonate, there's heat, and we know CO2 has come out because we did the, the flame test and we did the, um, the lime water test. So we know that this and this both exist. Okay. Now the question then becomes, well, what is the question mark? Okay. So from looking at, chem at the chemicals, one carbon atom and two oxygen atoms are consumed. So we don't need to worry about this, and we don't need to worry about two of these. So there's only one left. Okay. So what could be left over, possibly? So the only things that are left over are calcium, a one calcium atom and an oxygen atom. Okay. And it's very likely that because they're already bonded together, because it's in the CaCO3 molecule as a whole, because they're already bonded together, it's likely that they'll stay bonded together. So you'll get CaO as your other product. Okay? And the way to test that is to see if when you dilute it in water, when you dissolve it in water, if you get um, a basic solution out. If you do, you may have gotten CaO. Okay, so for the, the people that like baking, um, sodium carbonate or sodium bicarbonate, but we'll just say sodium carbonate for simplicity, is often used in baking. And its purpose is obviously to make the cake rise and also bread, okay, so leavened bread. So from this um, investigation, explain why sodium carbonate makes raises bread and cakes. So why, now that we know what the decomposition of a carbonate looks like, well, why does it make bread rise? Okay, so these two things look like very unrelated topics, but really, if you think about it very carefully, they are actually the same thing. So, remembering that when you bake things, you put it in an oven, so it gets hot. So in the heat of the oven, sodium carbonate decomposes in a similar way to calcium carbonate. Now that decomposition produces CO2. Now if the sodium carbonate is well distributed through the mixture, so if you've mixed your dough very well, then the CO2 produced will create lots of little bubbles in the cake. And those little bubbles obviously take up space. And um, by taking up space, they make the, the bread or cake rise. Okay? So that's under the assumption, of course, that you've distributed it well throughout your system. You've mixed your dough very well. And so that's why cakes rise. Um, when you add this sodium carbonate or sodium bicarbonate. And essentially that's the only difference between flour and self-raising flour. You just add a little bit of they add a little bit of sodium carbonate or sodium bicarbonate into your flour mixture and that causes it to rise. Question 13. Given that sodium carbonate has the formula Na2CO3, write a balanced chemical equation for the decomposition by heat. Okay. So the same thing, we start with what we know. We know we get CO2 out because we just talked about it in the previous question. Now all we need to know is what this question mark is. Okay. So the chemicals remaining are two Na atoms and one O atom. Okay. So we've only got two Na atoms and one O atom. The valence of Na is one plus and the valence of O is two minus. And therefore the remaining product must be Na2O. Okay. Now that makes sense again, because if it's already bonded together, it's likely to stay that way if just one carbon dioxide has been removed. So you, that's probably a good place. Okay? And then you just write it out. Now if you look through the, the balancing, you've got two Na here, two Na here, so that's good. One carbon here, one carbon here, that's again good. Three oxygens here, one, two, three oxygens on this side, so it's all balanced. And that works out very well. Okay. Explain why the lit, ma the lit match test can identify the presence of CO2. So how does the lit match test actually work? Well, combustion requires the presence of oxygen or another oxidant. Right? It needs to have some kind of oxidant to allow the flame to burn. Now, CO2 cannot provide oxygen to the combustion system and only serves to absorb the energy emitted by the flame. 
So the flame is actually emitting energy, and um, what happens is it would, that energy would usually go into breaking up oxygen molecules. But all the CO2 is doing is just sucking up that energy and not leaving it to break up more, and doesn't even break up. So you're not getting any new reactants, so it's just absorbing energy from the reactions, and you're losing reactants, so it just quenches the flame, essentially. And that causes the flame to extinguish. Because it's absorbing all the energy the flame is emitting then, and not breaking up into oxygen molecules, then you can't have any more flame because all the energy is gone. Okay? So that's why carbon dioxide puts out um, fire. So we're going to look at now the last, the other test for carbon dioxide, the lime water test. So in this question, if lime water is given the chemical formula CaOH2, and in the presence of carbon dioxide, CaCO3 is produced, calcium carbonate. Write a balanced chemical equation for the reaction between CO2 and lime water. Okay. So we're actually going to look at what is the actual chemical reaction that's happening when carbon dioxide hits lime water. So from the question, again, as I always say, just write down the things that you do know. And if you don't know this equation, then we'll just derive it from sort of first principles. All you have to do is write down the things that you know first. We know that there's going to be calcium hydroxide. There's going to be carbon dioxide as our two reactants. They're the two things that are going to make the cloudiness happen. And we know that CaCO3 is produced, OK? Because the question tells us that. Now, the calcium and carbon dioxide are both accounted for in one of the products. So calcium here, carbon dioxide here, is accounted for in this product. So we don't need to worry about that. Go. No need to worry about those two. Okay. As well as one of the two oxygen atoms. So there's two oxygen atoms here in the two hydroxide molecules, or two hydroxide parts. So we can cancel one. Okay. But what's left? You've got two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom left over. So if you've got two hydrogen atoms and and an oxygen atom, you know, two hydrogen and oxygen, H2 and O, it's pretty logical that the other thing must be water, okay? Because we didn't see any gases being produced. Um, we didn't see uh, any sort of acidity. We, didn't, we can't assume that. So the best thing to do would be is probably water. So we'll just make water as well. So the final reaction is down the bottom here. So instead of a question mark, all we've got is water, okay? So if we were to balance, try and you know, just insanity check ourselves, you've got one calcium, one calcium, one carbon, one carbon, two, four oxygens, three, four oxygen, two hydrogen, two hydrogen. So it's all balanced. Okay? So again, may, this may not be the hardest question in the world, or you know, if you didn't know this, at least you do now. But it teaches you that if you just write down the things that you do know, it becomes very obvious what the answer should be. Okay? That concludes today's lesson on uh, the first-hand investigation for a thermal decomposition of a carbonate, which is quite a mouthful. And it also concludes our series on physical and chemical change. So hopefully in this time you've learned how to distinguish physical and chemical changes, and you've learned more about um, the decomposition of a carbonate. So I look forward to seeing you at our next lesson. Mm -hmm.